Okay, hi, I'm Professor Rebecca Perry. I'm based here at NTU and I work on insolvency law. Uh, I want to, want to introduce Professor Yvonne Joyce, who impressively has two papers today. Uh, Yvonne is a professor of accounting at the University of Glasgow. She's a chartered accountant and she is the chair of the Scottish Area Group of the British Accounting and Finance Association and a member of the Art Insolvency Service, our three steering group on diversity and inclusion in the insolvency profession. Now, this paper is co-authored with uh, Betty Wu, who is a senior lecturer in accounting and finance at the University of Glasgow, uh, who's also interested in various issues to do with corporate governance and corporate insolvency. But I'll hand over to Yvonne now. Thank you very much for that um, introduction. Um, I'm delighted to be here um, presenting at the Insolvency Service Conference. Uh, I'm delighted to be here presenting <laughs> at the Insolvency Service Conference and obviously to be here at Nottingham Trent University with its fantastic reputation for insolvency research um, and policy. So this is an empirical paper which focuses on the UK corporate insolvency procedure of administration. As the title suggests, our objective is to explore the effects of insolvency practitioner firms' market share and secured creditors' market share on the direct costs of insolvency. We also recognise that the relationship between IP firms and banks has and continues to receive political and media attention with reference to the operation of bank panels, fee discounting and the prospect of repeat work. So we also explore the effects of any prior relationship between IP firms and the banks on the costs of the insolvency process. Existing academic research has taken what might be termed as an institutional perspective with a focus on the claimants in insolvency and considers the incentives of those claimants relative to each other. These studies suggest that conflicts of interest between claimants may increase costs and lead to a socially suboptimal outcome. Other arguments, both theoretical and empirically tested, make reference to coordination issues amongst creditors and the potential for free riders. So what do we look at and why? Well, our study focuses on the distribution of the insolvent estate between the secured financial creditors and insolvency practitioner firms. One of the reasons that we do this is that because professional labor typically makes up the largest component of direct insolvency costs. These costs are paid in priority to distribution to creditors. And since by definition, there's not enough to repay all creditors in full, in ceteris paribus, the higher the professional fees, the lower the returns to creditors. We focus on the secured financial creditors because in the vast majority of UK insolvencies, they are the residual claimant. I'll briefly explain our three hypotheses, starting with the insolvency practitioner firms. The market for IPFs is complex and not well understood, being occupied by the whole range of accounting professional services firms, restructuring and legal practices. Theoretically, there is potential for the big four and large professional services firms to dominate the formal insolvency market. Franks and Sussman in 2005 suggest that their high reported insolvency costs for UK SMEs may be attributable to the non-competitive nature of the market for corporate insolvency professional services. Studies of the audit market and the effects of audit firm market share on audit fees suggest that the higher market share is actually associated with an audit fee premium. However, if auditing or other professional services are viewed as more homogenous, price competition ensues in order to gain market share and fees would fall. Relatedly, increased market share also generates economies of scale, resulting in more efficient professionals being able and possibly willing to discount fees. 
So it wouldn't be unreasonable to suggest that formal insolvency work is a fairly homogenous product, suggesting in turn that price competition might exist, and coupled with the potential for production efficiencies, this might result in lower costs. There's also the potential for loss-leading work on formal insolvency appointments. And this quote reproduced here from a qualitative um, interview-based paper points to the loss-leading work that insolvency practitioner firms take on, but which sits within the bigger portfolio of professional services. So we have reference to loss-leading work where insolvency practitioners are not getting a full fee but it's recognised as swings and roundabouts. The banks have a limited number of people that they're giving work to, and if you're not on the list, you don't get the chance to do the bigger work. So you've got to take the loss leaders. Consistent with this view of loss leaders, some earlier studies in the US describe a high volume, low margin strategy in the context of US Chapter 7 procedures amongst insolvency attorneys. Finally, insolvency practitioners appear to be very much aware of the impact of their fees on returns to creditors. So again, a quote here from an insolvency practitioner suggesting that it would be ridiculous to realize 120 grand of assets and take a 100 grand fee in that regard. So although they are paid in priority, it's not simply a case of taking the full cost of labor and overheads from the estate. There's recognition, if you like, of the size of the pot of the insolvent estate and how much is owed to creditors. So we set our first hypothesis as expecting a negative association between IP firm market share in the administration market and insolvency practitioner fees. This is consistent with the idea that the market is competitive and there is potential for production efficiencies arising from repeat play, enabling lower costs to be charged. We recognize that the reverse might hold if the IPF market power theory holds true. Turning to the secured financial creditors, we know from finance studies that powerful and active shareholders are able to extract a larger surplus in debt renegotiations. Prior studies in insolvency have highlighted the expertise dimension of secured bank creditor involvement in financial distress. We know banks are sophisticated capital providers and capable of exercising monitoring expertise. They also have market power arising from high bank industry concentration. Davidenko and Franks 2008 also show that a few large banks control small and medium entity lending in the UK and are hence in a position of power. As I mentioned, secured creditors are also very often the residual claimant in insolvency. Typically, they are undersecured, meaning that they do have a financial interest in keeping costs down. And finally, monopsony price effects have been documented in the audit market literature, where it's been found that powerful audit clients can exert pressure on auditors and drive down audit fees. A similar relationship could be constructed along the lines of banks as powerful clients of IP firms. So our second hypothesis is that we expect that where the market share of secured financial lending is high, costs will be lower, arising from stronger bargaining power, dominance and greater expertise in overseeing insolvency processes. And finally, looking at the relationship between secured financial creditors and IP firms, here, in contrast with the academic literature, which has shied away from exploring both the individual market shares of my two players, as well as the relationships between them, political and regulatory bodies have drawn attention to these variables and highlighted potential concerns arising from it. As far back as 2010, the previous Office of Fair Trading identified the need for professional insolvency firms to build relationships with financial institutions in order to help secure repeat work. Thus, fee discounting is used by IPFs to build relationships with the banks. 
the OFT reports greater fee discounting in cases where the bank is undersecured. IPs would argue that they adopt a common sense business approach to setting fees, as the previous quote highlighted. In other words, discounting fees below normal recoveries where the secured creditor receives less than 100%. The All-Party Parliamentary Group on Fair Business Banking report published in 2021 continues to draw attention to the practice of operating bank panels and the potential dependency for some IP firms on securing future work from the lead financial institutions. In terms of pricing, however, the APPG does acknowledge that panel agreements are a normal practice for controlling costs such as, in our case, the hourly rates charged by IP firms. We also know banks are tough negotiating players. And again, this quote from an insolvency practitioner interviewee highlights that tough bargaining. Do the banks tell you what you're going to get? Yeah. Are they sophisticated buyers? Absolutely. They know exactly what to expect, and they can benchmark from one firm to another. So when we put in our request for a fee, do we get knocked back? Do we get them negotiated? Absolutely. So our third hypothesis tests whether this IPF, secured creditor relationship, has any effect on insolvency practitioner fees. Based on our preceding discussion, we expect that where a prior relationship exists, this will moderate the negative relationship between secured creditor dividends and IP fees. So we know that as insolvency practitioner fees go up, secured creditor dividends go down. But we expect a prior relationship to moderate that effect. So as secured creditor dividends increase, IP fees decrease by less where a prior relationship exists. This is what we mean by a pain and gain sharing hypothesis. Just briefly on the data in the, in the interests of time. Our data consists of the entire population of administration filings of Scottish registered companies in the calendar years 2012 to 13. The data set is manually built using multiple databases, including the Edinburgh Gazette, Fame, and UK Companies House. We gather a range of qualitative um, information and also quantitative information around realizations and costs and so on and so forth. We also gather IP firms and lead financial institutions for an earlier and later period to allow us to um, identify pairing and for market share analysis. In terms of some of our descriptive statistics, we find that 88% of cases are handled by 13 IP firms, accounting for 92% of total IP fees. For our calendar years, KPMG is the market leader for the administration appointments. Of course, the market has changed somewhat from when we gathered the data. As many of you will know, KPMG sold its restructuring service line to Interpath Advisory, and there have been some other consolidations and rebranding of firms within the insolvency sector. We calculate what's referred to as the herfindahl hirschman Index, and this is an indicator of the amount of competition among firms in an industry. You can see from our HHI graph on the right, which is based on number of cases, that the index is mainly below 0.1. This indicates an unconcentrated industry. So it is a rather competitive market from the point of view of IP firms, and one which generally appears stable over time. This provides some initial evidence in support of hypothesis one, i.e. the administrations um, are a potentially homogenous service and or price competition is present in order to gain market share. Just some of our um, des descriptive statistics on the companies entering insolvency. Consistent with other studies, our descriptive statistics show that insolvency in the UK is largely a small and medium-sized entity phenomenon. Our top three secured financial creditors 
are Bank of Scotland, Clydesdale Bank and Royal Bank of Scotland. 96% of insolvent companies have either fixed or floating charge security arrangements and 83% have both. Insolvency practitioner fees as a percentage of total realizations come in at 9% looking at our median figure and they represent 48% of total um, direct costs. You can see from our secured um, creditor dividend figure, the median is only 0.28 and therefore their recovery is well below 100%, meaning that they are indeed the residual claimant. We do have a significant number of cases in the construction and real estate sectors. And as you would expect, we've got a clustering of cases in the main cities of Scotland. So in terms of what our main findings are, and I won't um, drill down to the detail here, I'm not sure even if you'll be able to read some of these um, figures or not, but we run the regression for the full sample and we split our sample into two subsamples based on the degree of insolvency. And we use outstanding debt over total realizations as our measure to split the population. Our baseline position is as expected in that we find a significant negative association between secured creditor dividends and IP fees. So secured creditor dividends fall, IP fees are going up. And actually what the data there is showing is that this is driven in the more insolvent cases. In terms of our first two hypotheses, what we see is that higher market share for both IP firms and secured creditors is associated with lower IP fees. Therefore, hypothesis one and hypothesis two are supported in our study. Turning to hypothesis three, we find strong evidence that a prior relationship between an IP firm and a secured financial creditor moderates the negative relation between the secured creditor dividend and IP fees. And again, this is driven by the more insolvent cases. Using a slightly different measure of prior relationship based on number of pairings, we see that the relationship, the prior relationship effect is being driven by the pairings with a high level of repeat business. So again, we find support for our third hypothesis. We do perform many additional analyses and I won't be able to run through all of these findings with, us, with, with you. If we look at other direct insolvency costs, our findings show no significant effects on other direct insolvency costs arising from IP firm market share. But we do find that secured creditor market share again has a negative effect on other direct insolvency costs. So this again is consistent with hypothesis two. We do explore the possibility of cost loading recognizing that fixed charge realizations are not shared with other creditors, unlike the floating charge realizations. So if a creditor has both fixed and floating charges, there is a risk of potential cost loading from the fixed to the floating charges. Franks and Sussman, 2005, suggested that UK banks are able to maximize their secured asset recoveries by loading the direct costs of insolvency onto the assets subject to a floating charge. They perform a hypothetical allocation of costs based on the fixed to floating realizations. We do the same, and our results are the same as Franks and Sussman's, in that the actual allocation of costs to fixed charge assets is lower than the hypothetical allocation and the actual allocation to floating charge assets is higher than the hypothetical figure. We have to recognize here, however, that most fixed charge realizations relate to property, and therefore the costs or fees may actually not be significant, as most of that work could be carried out by property agents. Might be a little bit small to make out here. Um, and again, in the interests of time, I'll just focus on really what the key takeaway from this, this slide is. 
But essentially what we do is we split our population into four subgroups based on the market share of IP firms. So we have high market share IP firms versus low market share IP firms. And we also split it based on top three banks versus non top three banks. What we find is that that moderating effect of the prior relationship is actually driven by cases with lower IP firm market share and top three secured financial creditors. This is potentially consistent with a strategic move on the part of the low market share IP firms where they have a prior relationship with a top three bank. This is not the case for these low market IP firms where it's a non-top three secured financial creditor. And finally, we explore fee discounting by generating predicted IP fees by running the baseline regression model. And we calculate the difference between the actual IP fees and the predicted IP fees. So a negative value indicates the magnitude of our discounting. So again, it might be difficult to make out some of these figures, but I'm looking over at the left-hand side at the top half of the table there. And what we can see, well, maybe just about make out, is that the IP fee discount is higher in more insolvent cases. So this is consistent with prior literature but there's not that much difference in fee discounting between firms with a low market share and firms with a high market share. We don't have enough cases in all four groupings to run regressions, but in terms of mean dividends, and I'm looking now at the bottom half of that table on the left, both secured and unsecured creditors do worse in more insolvent cases, and that's to be expected. And we have some data there, but not many cases, as I said, which show that the unsecured dividend is lower with cases which are taken on with high IP firm market share. What we're trying to do there on the right is show the effect of IP fee discounting on future work, which in our case is 2014. Essentially, what we can see is that in more insolvent cases, higher fee discounting is evident where there is repeat work. So just finally, um, in terms of the, the sort of key takeaways and the limitations of our study, we acknowledge that our data set is small for statistical purposes, compounded further by a lack of data to calculate dividends for all categories. In our defense though, our study is actually one of the largest um, in the field. So just to summarize our key findings again, what we find is that IP firm market share is negatively associated with IP fees, but has no effects on other direct costs. So this is consistent with a high volume, low margin field, competitive, and perhaps reflecting production efficiencies. Secondly, secured creditor market share is negatively associated with IP fees and other direct costs. This is consistent with a strong market power position and ability to control costs. And thirdly, a prior relationship between IP firms and banks appears to be important. It moderates that negative association between secured creditor dividends and IP fees, which could provide evidence of pain and gain sharing. And I think I'm to time, I hope, hope so. Thank you. Okay, is there any questions for Yvonne? Nikodi? Hi, thank you very much Yvonne for that very insightful presentation. I uh, just wondered whether your analysis would differ if the actual context was the administration. Sorry, say that again? Uh, I just wondered whether you thought about the outcome of your analysis if the outcome of your inquiry was not administration. Now, obviously, I'm sure that's outside the specific scope of what you've considered, but I raise this question specifically because in administrations, you would expect typically a nice pool of assets um, with sensible repeats players in that system. 
But if you are not dealing with people or players on the top end of the market, and you're looking at, say, liquidations, I just wondered whether some of the outcomes in terms of cost and returns to creditors may vary. It's just food for thought, but I wondered what your thoughts or take would be on that. Mm. Thank you um, for that question. Our analysis is restricted to um, administrations. Um, I guess it would be interesting to do a similar analysis, obviously widening that to look at cases south of the border um, and obviously looking at a more recent period. And I think it would be good to reproduce the study in the context of liquidations. Any other questions? Just a very quick one. <clears throat> I, I'm not quite sure if you're, if you're suggesting it, but I wondered if you thought a future review of corporate insolvency, which might be some time away, uh, should look at the power of secured financial creditors and how, that, how they um, affect the market. Yes, um, I suppose would be a, a, a quick answer to that question. I, I think, I mean, as I said at the start, this is a, an academic paper, so we are just analysing the data and presenting it and, and, and showing that the position there. I think for both IP firms and banks, it, it has to be viewed in the context of the bigger portfolios that they have. Obviously, we are restricted in terms of just looking at administrations, but I think the issue around the power of banks is not going to go away, and so more work would be useful in that regard. Thank you. Caroline Sumner from R3. Obviously expecting not to enjoy that, but, but actually... <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but actually it backs up what a lot of our members have been saying for a long time. And I know we go back to 2013 and the profession and the world has changed since then. But a number of my members are saying bank panels artificially reduce the fees that they get and, and that's right when you think that actually the whole of the fee regime is based on creditors controlling IP fees not the other way around so I think in some respects I've taken a bit of positive stuff out of that <laughs> that actually there isn't the, the perception of banks artificially increasing fee rates for IPs doesn't happen yeah I mean I don't have all the descriptive statistics to hand but the the realisations are, are pitiful, the mean realisations within the insolvent estate, which goes back to the first question, are actually so small. Um, the cases do go on for quite a long time, but that can be for very good reasons, in particular when we think about the construction and, and, and property. Um, but the, the fees, if we can work out the fees on a daily basis that insolvency practitioner firms generate, they are... Um, p pitiful um, sums that they are um, recovering. So I do think the results overall point to this high volume, low margin industry, um, which might be a concern for the insolvency profession. Okay, I think um, we're due for coffee now, so I'll cut things short now. And um, you can ask uh, if on any remaining questions um, over coffee. Thank you.